Hey, Fringe listeners. Being that Chad and Cheese is the world's most dangerous HR podcast, we should give a warning label. Well, they sure do challenge the status quo or even what's good. They're fighting for great and they are passionate and authentic. And you might hear some choice words. We're pumped to partner with Chad and Cheese to push leaders' innovation muscle. Check out this episode. It's one of our favorites. Raise your hand if you know candidate matching, diversity initiatives, and resume scoring are kind of a big deal. Yeah, everyone. Okay, hands down. Guys, if you don't know Hiring Solved, you need to get with the cool kids. Hiring Solved is recruiting simplified. Their users get one-third of their week back by leveraging their AI and automation tech. Let Hiring Solved handle the administrative tasks of your job while you get back to, you know, being a human being. Hiring Solved empowers you to search faster, qualify candidates more effectively, and build the diverse candidate pipelines that you'll get your executive teams doing cartwheels. Not convinced? Let me count the ways Hiring Solved is going to blow your mind. One, automatically rate all your applicants. Set your must-haves and nice-haves, and their AI does the rest. Two, match candidates to jobs automatically across the entire candidate pool. Ditch multiple logins for a streamlined search and match experience. And three, Hiring Solves Diversity Analytics and Diversity Boost Tech shows the real-time diversity of your talent pool on a per-job basis and enables boosting the relevance of diverse classes. Holy high-volume recruiting, Batman. Oh, yeah. And they're integrated with all major ATSs, CRMs, and HRIS tech. Guys, I want you to visit HiringSolve.com now and sign up for a demo. You're welcome. Cheeseman out. Hide your kids. Lock the doors. You're listening to HR's most dangerous podcast. Chad Sowash and Joel Cheeseman are here to punch the recruiting industry right where it hurts. Complete with breaking news, brash opinion, and loads of snark. Buckle up, boys and girls. It's time for the Chad and Cheese Podcast. Oh, yeah. What's up, everybody? It's your favorite knuckleheads, a.k.a. the Chad and Cheese Podcast. As always, I'm your co-host, Joel Cheeseman, joined by the Eddie Van Halen to my diamond, David Lee Roth, Chad Sowash. <laughs> and today, we welcome the doctor, Dr. Tiffany Bandrith, DEI expert and a leadership and organizational psychologist to C-suite and senior leadership teams. Yes. <sighs> She's a lot smarter than us, Chad. And it's good that we have these guests. Welcome, Dr. Tiffany. Can I call you Dr. Tiffany, or do you like Dr.? Brandreth better. Uh, no, no. Um, actually, I'm affectionately referred to as Dr. T or Dr. Ooh. B by clients. Ooh. Like Mr. T. Like <laughs> Mr. T. <Yes. laughs> exactly. But Dr. T. I pity the fool who messes with Dr. T. Uh, yeah. yes. okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, doctor, thank you for joining us today. Uh, our, a lot of our listeners aren't aware of you or know you. Can you give us a quick bio on what makes Dr. Tiffany Tick. Oh, okay. So in short form, I'm going to say I am off the chart introvert, but come across as an off the chart extrovert. And uh, what makes me tick is I'm super passionate and convicted in general about life and who, who we're trying to be in this world and making a difference and doing that through um, the work that I do while also having fun. And you're also, you, you like the food though. You like the food and you like the water. Tell us a little bit about this. I think about food from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep. And I'm thinking about what I'm going to be eating every day, all day long. <laughs> so, Are you a food snob? Are you a food snob though? Will you no. do the fast foods or will you just do any foods? I will. Well, okay. So I have a, I have a funny real quick story. I went and ate, what is that Michelin star restaurant in, um, in, Napa Valley. Yeah, crickets. You're going to get okay. crickets for well, there's a, I, I And it was a five hour exceptional dining experience where, oh, yeah. right? Okay, matching champagne, wine, food, all oh, that yeah. with, with exceptional food. Mm-hmm. Five hours. Yes. I went home the next day. I ate tater tots and ramen noodles. <laughs> 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 so, That's good balance. That's good yeah. balance. Yes. And, and I barely cook. 
And you said the perfect woman didn't exist, Chad. <laughs> and she does. Here she oh, is. We sure. call her Dr. T. Okay, and, so and so we can hate her more. Where are you calling us? Calling in from, Dr. T? Okay, I am, I live in Orange County in California, but I'm originally from a very small town called Battleground, Washington. And I we just had our 30 year reunion, so I looked up the population back when I was graduating. I, uh-huh. I graduated in '92. The population that the U.S. Census says was 3,700 people when I graduated. <laughs> it is now 21,000. That's what tw- uh, in 2021 what the census said. So that gives uh-huh. you an idea of um, growth. I like yes. how she diverted <laughs> us from California to Washington. Uh-huh. She did a really nice, nice deflection yeah. on that one. But, but right. also she gets a big applause because she's an Xer. Oh. That's right. Gen X. Very proud of that. Oh, well, whatever. Never mind. <laughs> Amen. And do you remember? Right. I don't know if you remember this. So the way gender identity is being spoken about today and really emphasized is the mm-hmm. way generational diversity was being spoken about and educated on back in the early 2000s. And I remember Gen X had had no part of the conversation. Everyone is paying attention to baby boomers. We still don't. Yeah, we still don't. Right. So And millennials. And I remember going, hey, what about us? But because our numbers are so low, we still they still don't care. What did you say? You've been in the DEI space for nearly 18 years, but probably more than that. Longer, but, but mid-90s. Being in the DEI space, even before that acronym even existed, what's been the biggest change? Mm, ooh, good question. Uh, I'm going to say the biggest change is probably... Uh, the receptivity today versus back in the mid nineties, late nineties. So terminology Mm -hmm. of course continues to change. In fact, I, uh, the department was called multicultural affairs and it was in a renowned uh, medical school and hospital. Uh And we were the first team to design and develop, deliver diversity training. So the biggest change is that it started off as training and now it's a you know entire initiative being funded. I mean, poorly in general, but being funded by corporations. <laughs> well, that being said, okay, we're we're seeing billions and billions of dollars on DEI training every single year, but yet we're not seeing the outcomes. Can we go ahead and just put a stake in it and say that DEI training just doesn't work? Okay, so yes, I'm gonna and so. Prior to 2020, right, May 2020, it was reported that we're spending $8 billion a year. And oh my gosh, that's so much money. But in comparison to $166 billion that is being spent on leadership development, and we know that Gallup continues to report engagement level, disengagement is around 70% based on poor leadership and management. Yet we never, ever say leadership development is training, it it is failing. So one of the points you make that DEI is failing, and you talk about uh, in a LinkedIn post that that we are simultaneously advocating and oppressing DEI efforts. Can you explain that? Yes. Okay. So we've only been doing research on, right, what's working, what isn't working. We haven't been researching and focusing on the people that are committed to diversity and the decisions that are being made to advance it or to prevent it because those decisions are are concealed and we aren't transparent about that, right? And so um, the field has been led through what I refer to as good intentions, right? Well-intended people who want to be able to make a difference yet without the qualifications to actually be leading this work. And I'm gonna say there's different facets. So let's just say organizational change, right, requires Mm -hmm. An right. organizational psychologist who knows how to do conflict management, who knows leadership development, and also diversity and inclusion. DNI experts weren't trained in org psychology and leadership development. Leadership development people aren't trained in DNI, and org psychology actually doesn't train in DNI either. So what we're seeing is a bunch of figureheads who literally have no fucking clue what they're doing. And and let me liken this to something real quick. I, I'm, a, I'm a veteran and I'm also on the, uh, you know, obviously the, the town acquisition recruiting side of the house. Just because you put a veteran 
in a spot doesn't mean they know how to hire veterans and what the actual issues are. Is that what you're saying with regard to the other aspects of, of DEI? Just because you put somebody in that space and they could be a person of color or a female, it doesn't mean they know what the fuck they're doing. Ooh, so you're just touching on something highly controversial, but spot on. So you just named one of what I'm referring to as five unconscious deceptions but highly uncomfortable truths of what is leading DEI and driving it directly into what I've trademarked and coined as the DEI death zone, an analogy to Mount Everest death zone. So experience is one of those five. And the way I define this as being from a marginalized classification, qualifies to hold position and are exempt from making oppressive DEI decisions. I love how you uh, sort of frame death zone with Mount Everest. Can you dive into that just a little bit until we, and then we'll get into the other four uh, biases that you talk Ooh, about? Okay. So um, Mount Everest is the highest peak, right, in the world. Mm-hmm. And hundreds of people go and seek to, to climb that. The death zone is near the high, highest elevation peak where, where the elevation is so extreme and the altitude levels are so high that people are actually dying. So you can only spend a certain amount of time there in order to summit and get to the peak. So this is the place where most climbers die. Now, Sherpas right, are the navigation experts guiding individuals and climbers up the mountain to get to the peak. So they are also carrying all the supplies and you have a range of people who are highly experienced experts at this, but then the younger individuals that don't have the experience yet. So people are paying a discounted rate to have a Sherpa that will take them up the mountain and, and take their direction versus take the direction from the Sherpa. And so what ha- there's two parts of the death zone. The mm-hmm. initiative itself is falling into the death zone without it being known. So this is what I call advocacy. Advocacy is all the feel-good um, efforts that are happening. Allyship, one bias training that's an hour long, uh-huh. right? Um, speakers coming in, recruitment. Everyone wants to share their recruitment numbers. But the death zone is where all the inequity and the non-inclusive behaviors are being permitted and allowed. So the death zone is happening, but unbeknownst to the larger body. And then the Mm -hmm. death zone for diverse, marginalized individuals. So, you know, this whole notion, speak truth to power. Yes. So I was doing that way, way, way before it was even coined a term. And um, the the reason why I'm coming out with all of this as well is I'm, I'm really bored by all the recommendations and all the articles that, that keep coming out because there are the same redundant solutions that are only topical and surface level, and we're, o- we're defining the problem in, um, in the wrong way. So when all the speakers, like you go to these conferences and, and such, and so all the speakers talk about, be courageous, speak your truth, be authentic, and look, I'm up here, so because I made it, so can you. And all the people that didn't make it aren't on stage. And so by telling people, speak truth to power, you can do it when power won't even speak truth to power. So these 35 executive teams that I've worked with, there's a power dynamic within the executive teams where when I'm doing my my informational meetings and so forth, the number one thing that executives ask me is, is this going to be kept confidential? So if executives aren't willing to speak the truth, among the executive team, why the hell are we advising people who are already disadvantaged at lower levels to speak to to power when they're being penalized in really subtle ways? I identified nine behaviors that are happening by DEI, by advocates for DEI in senior leadership roles that are penalizing people for doing that. So, so your research reveals that women, women, are the highest demographic representing the people who are oppressing real change. Talk to me about that. That is, that to me is surprising as hell because the 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 exact people who are being oppressed. Maybe th- this shouldn't surprise us because Jeff Bezos. Everybody says I want to be that, and everybody knows you're not going to be that, right? But why are why are women oppressing this this? any of this. Okay. So it goes back to what we just talked about regarding experience being one of the right uh, unconscious deceptions and truths. So the reason why this is so prominent is because when you're from a marginalized classification, such as being female, so you experience sexism, 
there isn't a reflection on am I, could I be a racist? Could I be homophobic, right? So people from these classes say, because I experience racism, therefore I'm not, I'm not a racist or I'm not a sexist. Because I've experienced sexism, I'm not, right? So that's the reason why this is happening. And then I have so, I have so much of them that I, I want to unpack here. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This sounds like the I have black friends oh, God. conversation from white dudes. Is, this, is it the same thing? Yes. Okay. So I, this is what's really interesting um, regarding the group that came out as being one of the highest in advancing DEI were males. 73% wow. of those representing, right, advancing were males, whereas 27% of women were advancing DEI. I have my finger over the applause soundbite, but I'm afraid to get canceled if I do that. <laughs> for white men. Oh. I, just, I can't do it. I know. I know. This is what I'm saying. This is so controversial. This is really controversial. And okay, so I have to, I want to share this. So compliance is my other, is one of the other unconscious deceptions. Oh, talk to me. Okay. So I'm going to bring in HR here. So being stewards of the law equates to having expertise and being qualified to supervise and oversee DEI. That is false because HR leaders are also oppressing people and DEI. So what we've done is... We, and I understand, so when you talk, ask what, what one of the biggest changes are, we equate bias and discrimination as the same thing. So because HR is responsible to protect the organization again, and people against discrimination, we believe, okay, so of course DEI belongs there. Actually, it's a complete conflict of interest because, yes, HR is about the people, but who are they first for? The company. And, and so, and we know that by, so there's a major conflict of interest when an employee raises a claim of discrimination after leaving the organization, they don't hire the internal lawyer, <laughs> defense lawyer, they have to get their own plaintiff, right, employment attorney. And so the corporate attorney at no point ever represents the employee. And in fact, and we saw this, let's use the NFL as an example, right? We saw Brian Flores's text messages. And what did the NFL um, come out with? A statement saying, we will defend against these claims and which are without merit. This is the stance the HR, the, the legal department and the company takes every single time. So all the counseling that HR does when there's employee relation problems, what are they doing? They're documenting. Why are they documenting? They're documenting because in case they ever need to be able to use that to defend against any claims. So the, the legal advisement that's happening is at the detriment of actually helping in developing employees and managers. So what I'm hearing is, so HR largely is to keep the company out of trouble, i.e. keep it out of court. But also, if you look at DEI initiatives, that's a fairly disruptive uh, strategy by most companies' like accounts, right? So am I hearing you say that HR, who traditionally is in charge of keeping the company like risk averse, is now in charge of totally shaking things up and 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 injecting diversity, inclusion, and equity into a company, which by its nature is sort of rocking the boat. So is HR, am I hearing that correctly? And secondly, is HR the wrong department to be instilling DEI initiatives in a company? Absolutely, because so it goes back to the conflict of interest regarding if their job is to reduce risk, minimize and conceal risk, why are they going to make decisions that will uncover and, and, and create vulnerability to create change? So HR actually rejects transparency. So everywhere in all the literature, what do we hear? DEI, we need transparency and accountability. So therefore, and this is where, when I talk about the, the, even the, oh, I'm going to say this, the powerhouse, <laughs> <laughs> the powerhouse manage, global management consulting companies, because they're industry leaders, right, should be leading in creating disruption. Yet they're still also following the same formula, meaning transparency, everyone is love. So this is the advocacy. Everyone loves to be transparent about the billions of dollars that they're putting back into the, the community. 
and the recruitment numbers, which are always what mid-level and below, never, mm -hmm. never above. Right. No one is being transparent around the decisions that are being made to not advance DEI by us practitioners. They're not being transparent regarding the discrimination claims, regarding turnover, litigation costs, settlement, and employee engagement numbers. They just want to show the numbers that look make them look good as opposed to the ones that really are the true numbers of yes. what the company actually is. Yes. And so Diversity Inc., which is mm -hmm. the right renowned, so they are perpetuating this um, and, and all the other companies that are rewarding this bullshit is what you're, is what I'm hearing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this, so this is my new analogy regarding, regarding the feel good. And then the not so feel good is everyone is playing offense and communicating offense and no one wants to communicate defense because it gets you disliked and blackballed. We'll get back to the interview in a minute. But first, we have a question for Andy Katz, COO of Next. Andy, if a company wants to actually come to Next and utilize your database and, and target texting candidates, I mean, how does that actually work? Right. So we have the software to provide it two different ways. If an employer has their own database of opted in text messages, whether it's through their ATS, we can text on their behalf. Or we have over 8.5 million users that have opted into our text messaging at this point. So we can use our own database. We can dissect it by, obviously, by geography, by function, um, any which way. Some, and sometimes we'll even parse the resumes of the opted in people to target certifications. So we really can you know, dive really deep if they want to hone in on, you know, just give me the best hundred candidates that I want to text message with and have a conversation back and forth with versus going and saying I need 30,000 retail people across the country. And that's more of a, you know, yes, no text messaging back and apply. For more information, go to hiring.next.com. Remember, that's next with the double X, not the triple X. Hiring.next.com. So, right, we're applying positive psychology, which, of course, we need to. Uh, let's focus on the good. Let's focus on the, what we know. And I'm going to I'm really bad at it, talking about analogies. But uh, right, <laughs> I, what I've heard is in football, right, offense, what sells the tickets, but defense is what wins the game. And yes, yeah. offense and defense require two different skill sets. So all the recommendations and all the solutions that we hear is what? always on the offense because no one wants to talk about the defense because it's the bad underbelly of DEI and, mm -hmm. and oppression. And so even, oh gosh. Okay. So Deloitte just came out <laughs> with a 2022, <laughs> right. Um, DEI report. Uh -huh. Okay. So I was in shock when I saw that their, their entire, the majority of their focus was on all the recruitment. Their equity section had a complete, it was a small paragraph. And so this is equity in talent reviews and succession planning. And this is mm -hmm. where the majority of the bias sits, that HR is not qualified because they're not bias experts. To do talent reviews and succession planning and leadership development, you have to be an expert in behavior, bias, and diversity. Mm -hmm. right? And so... Even Deloitte couldn't speak to that. They said equity is an outcome. And I understand they could be using inclusion and equity, you know, interchangeably, and, but they weren't touching on anything about succession planning, which tells me the fact that you were able to be detailed and comprehensive in all these areas, but that tells me you're missing that, uh, you're missing that expertise. But I'm, I'm used to that. What I was really, I'm going to say offended that Deloitte would say, um, I want to find in this section at the very end, they said, okay, here it is. Ultimately, selecting the most qualified candidate is always the objective. I literally went, holy shit, did Deloitte just print <laughs> this on paper? Yeah, meritocracy, baby, meritocracy. They're promoting implicit bias. So anytime, right, the sequence of that sentence is they only talk about most qualified candidate when they're talking about diversity. 
Mm -hmm. And so how are they perpetuating, promoting implicit bias that has been, I call it psychological conditioning us since affirmative action that then diverse candidates from the starting line are inferior. That's what that sentence implies. That's the loophole right there, baby. That's 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 a loophole. So so let me let me hit bias with some unconscious bias. So we just dropped an amazing interview with Steve Pemberton, the CHRO over at Work Human today, and he asserts that unconscious bias doesn't exist anymore. So does that mean first and foremost, do you agree with that? Secondly, does that mean that people are hiding behind the term unconscious bias while they're still just plain biased, racist, and misogynist. Okay, so I listened to, to Steve's interview. Excellent. Um, and I disagree. <laughs> hey, good. Okay, okay. Um, I, I disagree. And, and, but I think it's because of the... So this, um, this goes to the micro aspects of diversity that's getting ignored. So we focus on the macro. We don't focus on the micro. What I mean by that is unconscious bias means I have an attitude that is in complete contradiction of what I fully rationally am espousing, committed to, and and believe myself to be as part of my identity. So people see themselves a certain way Mm -hmm. and without realizing there's blind spots, behavior, attitudes, mindsets that are um, in contradiction to their value system. So yes, unconscious bias still exists, but to his point, conscious bias is also existing. We actually need to stop talking about bias without addressing oppression. So I think what he's saying is we're we're all comfortable with bias because bias is actually, it's a thought that is still contained internally that hasn't been released out in the world. So when bias is exhaled right into a word, a behavior, a decision, that's a microaggression. However, when it's done by leadership, what is that? Oppression. But as soon as we hear oppression, we're like, oh, shit, that's a four-letter word. And, and now you have to be penalized because you said oppression. When we actually have to see oppression as not good or bad, I mean, even though it's bad, right? But we have to get people to, be, to stop judging people, stop labeling people and actually say, okay, this is the outcome and the result of a bias, which is oppression. Let's unpack that and, and, and dismantle this, but we're not training. So when you mention training is ineffective, yes, it is because this whole notion of changing hearts and minds, Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw on my website, I'm like, oh my God, can we stop saying changing (laughs) hearts and minds? Because that is not changing behaviors and decisions for people and people management roles, knowing how that pertains to um, hiring, developing, evaluating performance, um, talking about behaviors and leadership characteristics that are leading to succession planning. Okay. Okay. So how do we change this? You have been advising companies for over two decades, right? So how do we change this? How how are you telling companies that we need to change this? How do we become different? Oh, man. Well, that that's like five more episodes. So I'm gonna um, go. uh, So I'm gonna go to the to the areas that cost no money, because the excuse always is we don't have budget, which by the way, I started removing that barrier. So they could not use that excuse of we don't have the budget. And I said, you know what? If you really want to reach the summit right, of DEI, which no one has, everyone is still at base camp. So until oppression is dismantled, everyone will be at base camp and they won't even be ascending the climb up to the peak. So I'm going to only give um, advisement that will not take any um, budget. The very first one is as human beings, what? We are motivated by pain and pleasure. So and we have to identify an incentive and a consequence to becoming inclusive. So right now, people are getting promoted based on right a set of skills, making diversity, um, being, I'm going to say DEI, um, being skilled in DEI is optional. So you get to be in your position and whether or not you are is optional and, and your intention is good enough for us. So we have to have some type of incentive or consequence first that's identified. And for every leadership team and company, that'll be different. Second, we talked about this. We have to remove the authority of DEI um, out of HR so that HR doesn't supervise and oppress decisions of DEI. And it has to only be under the CEO. But it also, I'm going to plug the most damaging and detrimental 
unconscious bias leading DEI, and that is power, right? So it's a misuse of power. Um, the way I define this is being in a position of power authorizes and qualifies to make credible DEI decisions. We have to remove the, the decision-making power away from the person who's not qualified. And so um, it can be under the CEO, but the person who's deciding where the budget allocation should go, it shouldn't be, if you're going to do billions externally, cut that in half and invest that internally to the development of the culture and the people. And then um, I have five advocacy behaviors that the 20% of, of uh, my the, the executives that were actually advancing DEI and not oppressing it, they had five distinctive behaviors that nobody else was doing. And then, um, and then we have to, so the other one, this is really, really tough, but I'm going to say it's one of the um, biggest dilemmas. I call them diversity dilemmas. So one of the biggest diversity dilemmas that is happening across the board. What happens when you have a executive or leader that is producing exceptional results for the company, but exhibiting poor leadership behaviors so, and that are biased? So you have, so HR in general are, is not able to distinguish between, let's say, a really bad micromanager, but also um, having bias against marginalized groups. They're, they're putting it under the, the umbrella of, well, they're just a bad manager that needs to be better developed, not realizing, well, yes, they have poor leadership skills and they're also biased <laughs> and, right. and creating o o oppression. So I, ha I, I want to share an analogy. Let's see if I can deliver this right. So this is sort of my aha regarding we actually have to stop making being um, an inclusive leader optional in terms of um, rising into position, which is different also than diverse. So we are focusing on hiring diversity, which is absolutely critical, of course. Being diverse does not mean that you're inclusive, right? And, and so think of it this way. We say diversity training is failing, all of that. When have you ever heard, so let's take the driver's license test, right? When you fail your driver's license test, written and driving, do we say, that the driver's license test failed, or do we say that the driver failed? The driver. <laughs> okay, so then for all the people, right, who fail their driver's license, then would we allow them to drive on the road without continuing having their permit? Well, no, it's illegal. No. Right. Well, not, it's not. So I'm looking at it from the safety. We don't let them drive without a license or without an authorized adult because it's irresponsible for the safety of the individuals. Now, the other part that that is always talked about in diversity is mm -hmm. mandatory. So because it's a mandatory training, it's creating more resentment. So therefore, we have to remove the mandatory nature of it. And I agree. We would never say, though, to get your driver's license test. We're going to remove the mandatory nature because it's pissing off drivers that they're not passing. So we're going to let you go ahead and drive. And then we're going to trust your intention and commitment to become a responsible driver and eventually pass your test. Hell no. Yeah, you might want to start doing an analogy with gun laws around that. I'm sorry, right, go ahead. Same go ahead. Thing. Okay. Oh, yeah, let's, let's not even go down that road. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so but that's what we're doing with diversity. We're saying... We're not going to make this mandatory and you can still become a leader. Um, you can fail class, but you didn't fail bias class. It's the class that failed and the curriculum that failed, which, yes, I agree. We need to improve the curriculum. Absolutely. Um, because there's a formula that's being used that's ineffective. But it's, but it's because we're only targeting one segment of a learner when I've identified four different segments. So the people who are more advanced in development and, and diversity in general, that nobody's getting developed. Because everyone's still focusing on the, let's say, entry level knowledge of DEI. All right, all right, all right. You're 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 bringing up you're bringing up driving tests. You're bringing up the '80s for me, and we're talking Gen <laughs> X stuff. So I'm going to pivot to this real quick, uh, Doctor T. As a card carrying Gen Xer, I assume you've seen the movie Boomerang, starring Eddie Murphy. I'm pausing, laughing. I, this is because I was just talking about Boomerang and how my feet would pass oh, no. Eddie Murphy's. <laughs> All right. Okay, if, you yeah. haven't, if you haven't seen it, you got to watch it. But one of the yeah, things yeah. at the time was uh, Eddie, Eddie works in an all black advertising agency. 
which at the time was a little bit controversial, but it reminds me of our conversation and uh, an interview that Chad and I did a year or two ago with Cindy Gallup. And Cindy Gallup said uh, sort of defeatedly, nothing's going to change until businesses are started and become successful with diverse people. So women-owned businesses, black-owned businesses, et cetera. Where do you stand on that? Should there be more of that? Does the government need to get more involved with, with, with diversity businesses? What's your take? We're focusing on the benefit and value of diversity, of highly diverse organizations, which I agree with. We're, we're completely negating the middle part. And I'm actually highly concerned with all the diversity that's coming in because there's no investment of the development of the people. So what I mean by this is we know that there's four stages of high-performing teams, right? Forming, uh, norming, storming before they get to the high-performing stage. We also know the five dysfunctions of a team, right? And um, yet... We are not applying those principles to the diversity that is that is happening. So, and I've been in companies where it was highly diverse, and there was it was beautiful and it was ugly at the same time because there was so much dysfunction that wasn't being managed. Because when you increase differences, what is that going to do? It's going to increase conflict unless people are skilled at managing um, diversity. So before we get to the innovation and the creativity and the business result for the diversity, we actually have to be able to manage through the conflict and the storming period and the dysfunctions that that are that are there without diversity and only amplified with diversity. And that is the DEI death zone kids with Dr. T, aka Dr. Tiffany Brandreth. Doc T, can you please let our listeners know where they can find out more about you and then also learn a little bit more about this uh, this death zone? Death zone. <laughs> yeah, so my website, Dr. Tiffany Brandreth, but then LinkedIn, I've literally, I have no uh, social media marketing and such, but I've just started on LinkedIn to um, shell out this data and these findings and these discoveries and solutions one step at a time because there's so much. So um, LinkedIn is where I, I am starting to publish. Love it. Excellent. Chad, another one in the can, baby. We out. We out. Thank you for listening to what's it called? The podcast. The Chad. The cheese. Brilliant. They talk about recruiting. They talk about technology. But most of all, they talk about nothing. Just a lot of shout outs of people you don't even know. And yet you're listening. It's incredible. And not one word about cheese. Not one. Cheddar. Blue. Nacho. Pepper Jack. Swiss. There's so many cheeses and not one word. So weird. Anywho, be sure to subscribe today on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. That way, you won't miss an episode. And while you're at it, visit www.chatcheese.com. Just don't expect to find any recipes for grilled cheese. It's so weird. We out! Everything is changing fast in talent acquisition. And keeping yourself up to date with the latest thinking, technology, and best practice is a challenge in itself. I'm Matt Alder host of the Recruiting Future podcast, the show that gives you weekly insights, inspiring stories and cutting edge thinking from practitioners who are at the front line of talent acquisition. Recruiting Future is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hide your kids, lock the doors. You're listening to HR's most dangerous podcast, Chad Sowash and Joel Cheeseman. Are you fucking kidding me, dude? Is this thing even on? <laughs> yes, that's what that red indicator on your screen means. Oh, Jesus. You know, we're closing <laughs> in on a thousand episodes. Yeah, a thousand. You think I'd get this right eventually? Oh, dude, no worries. I mean, it's all about great content over perfection. Thank baby Jesus for that one. Hi, I'm Chad Sowash. And I'm Joel Cheeseman, and we are the Chad and Cheese Podcast. Creative, huh? That's HR's most dangerous podcast. What exactly does that mean, Chad? 
Well, check out the explicit label for starters. Ooh, yeah, but any chucklehead can drop an F-bomb or two. True, true, but we have 40-plus years of combined experience in HR, talent, and tech, which means we know our shit and we're well-connected. God, we're old. But experience (laughs) and our network make for dangerous podcasts. But what really makes us dangerous is that we don't beat around the bush by asking bullshit softball questions. Unless it's a setup for a knockout, of course. Yeah, we're pretty famous for that, aren't we? What makes us dangerous is that we know talent is the center of every team, every business, and every single fucking economy. Yep. Without talent products and services, your favorite brands just crumble. Our job is to stop the old 1950s line of thinking by challenging all of the bullshit we're seeing out in the market. And man, there's a lot of bullshit out there. Exactly. Talent is the center of everything in business, which is why you and your team need a steady diet of the Chad and Cheese podcast. Mmm, yummy. Available at chadcheese.com, Stitcher, Spotify, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We We out.